Pretty good. good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for a program with two distinguished Arizonans, neither one of whom behaves, so it'll be sort of fun. <laughs> this is Marshall Trimble, our stage historian, who has had an accident. You fell on your face? Well, you have to use the this mic. Is can this is cancer of the nose. Uh, uh -huh. I fell on the face before that. I still got a bit of a shiner. But, um, That's why you're wearing the black hat? I'm trying to change my looks. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, over here is the irrepressible John Dalton, row columnist and author, and all those good things. So this program got started because Marshall wrote a fan letter to me about John's book about the bomb shelter. And I thought, wow, if he loves it that much, he should come down here and talk to John and, and to all of you about why it's such a nifty book. And then, of course, you have a book of your own called Arizona Oddities, which he can talk to you about. And John, possibly as an Arizona oddity or whatever, you, <laughs> you can respond. I can, talk, I can talk to you about him. Okay. All right. So, Marshall, why don't you go first? first? Yep. Well, I, I, I got a, I've been following John's career ever since he was uh, old friends in the audience. So, um, I'll have to be good. Um, <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Um, I followed his career since he was at, at uh, well, not at Coronado High School. We started out at Coronado High School together. Uh, you were the teacher, I believe, and I was your student. Uh, that, 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 that is like correct. That. But, uh, but anyway, I just, I just, I loved his column when he was writing for the Republic, and and I hated to see him. He went to all places, Seattle. But um, my son was up there in the army, so I guess I visited Seattle a few times, and and it, man, it's cold up there. Uh, that's and it, it we rains. Don't want to tell people that we don't want people to move there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what it was when it came down. I said, "What? It, what? What's this?" You <laughs> thought it was fallout. <laughs> so anyhow, I I. I been following his books all the, and I what I love about him I, I, that's what I really have to say for John is that uh, it's fun to read a book I can remember back in the 1960s reading Ian Fleming I got hooked on Ian Fleming and I thought I know that place and I was playing I was playing music in a bar in Las Vegas and uh, you know things like that and I could identify with it and when I picked up John's books I thought I know where that place is I would uh, all my life I've known that place. Um, I was born here. So um, anyway, I just, and then uh, Bomb Shelter was my la the last one I've had a chance to read. I read it, I swear I read it in two nights up at my cabin at Christopher Creek. And I just, that's when I think I, I wrote you. And I just said, um, this, is, this is so much fun to read about Phoenix. And um, those of us who studied the early history of Phoenix, we know about the deuce. And um, I've been on the Arizona Peace Officer Memorial Board for about 30-some years, and, and I, I, I have a lot of good friends who were cops in the deuce back in the mm -hmm. 40s and 50s and heard a lot of good stories from them. Mm -hmm. So anyway, John's, John's stories just ring a bell with me, and he just, he just once he gets up, what, what you get into it, you're, you're hooked, mm -hmm. and you usually don't want to put it down. My books, they say you can't, that once you put it down, you can't pick it up again. But, <laughs> but John was just the opposite. Well, now it's my turn. Okay. Uh, because uh, it, it's very hard to get out of the habit of saying Mr. Tremble. I mean, I, I used to be taller, and uh, I was not always in this damn thing. It was a combination ski accident and sniper. Yeah. as E.J. Montini said. Um, but I was blessed to go to Coronado High School. It was one of the best high schools in the country. And it had some of the finest teachers that I ever encountered. And I actually went on to become a, a professor at a teacher's college. <clears throat> and so you know what's a good teacher and what's a bad teacher. And we had uh, the best at Coronado. Uh, we had Bob Frazier and Eugene Hansen, Jim Newcomer, Ralph Bradshaw, Sally Sherrod. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but probably one of the best um, was Mr. Tremble. 
Um, he taught uh, Arizona history, and he you you have to go beyond the man in black look here because <laughs> yes he he played guitar songs and told us about the outlaws and and all of that but he he's also a such a gifted natural teacher and I can't tell you how rare that is uh, it, it wasn't completely rare at Coronado because it was such a wonderful school and so as I went on to become a paramedic for a while and then teach at a college for a while and then make a wrong turn into journalism I made a wrong turn <laughs> into point at Albuquerque um, and uh, be have that misspent life until now I'm at the Seattle Times. Uh, I have always followed uh, Mr. Trimble Marshall's career. Uh, he went on to Scottsdale Community College. Um, he has touched so many lives personally um, and in great ways, in inspirational ways. One of the reasons that I uh, studied history as a double major and then history in graduate school, I was going to go on to become a professor of history, but my, my PhD advisor warned me in all seriousness that I wrote too clearly to be a professional historian. <laughs> but, I was still, but I was still trained to be a historian, the laying on of hands. Um, and, uh, you know, my advisor's advisor had been William Luchtenberg. Um, but it all kind of started with Marshall. And the combination of his teaching and the state I love was irresistible. I know it's Talton hates Arizona, right? <laughs> um, and then uh, after I left, I would always get a new book when one of Marshall's books came out. And there's not a one that I wouldn't recommend. I mean, I have in Seattle, I have a shelf and a half of Marsh Trimble books. And he, he touches on so many things from, uh, you know, it, it, it's absolute necessity if you're taking a road trip to have his roadside history of Arizona. Um, because of every little town has a, a, uh, a story to tell. <clears throat> And every little town fits together in the history of the state. Uh, his wartime in Arizona book it will teach you things you never knew. Um, when I do the rogue columnist Phoenix 101 history post, it's just an homage to Mr. Trimble. <clears throat> and then uh, I'm looking forward to delving into the new ones because of all the um, states that I have lived in, and I've lived in some weird ones. Um, Arizona has uh, the most oddities uh, and, and peculiarities, and, and we used to even have Route 666 before some idiot changed it, and so I look, I look forward to Barbara's uh, interlocution of, of Marshall and maybe a little bit of me, but it is, it is just an honor of the heart to be here tonight with this man who touched my life. Thank you, Mr. Tremble. Thanks, John. I, I have a loyalty to Coronado. We call them the golden years, and uh, I was a lost soul when I first went there. I was, uh, I really mean that. I'm not trying to do a sad story thing, but I was... I was a lost soul, and I, I walked in there, didn't know a thing about history. Um, I just wanted to teach history because <coughs> I'd been up working as a cowboy in Montana, and and um, I had an experience at Custer's Battlefield, the Little Bighorn, and and there I was all alone. Well, my brother's off somewhere wandering around, but I, I had I just had a, a, a one of those out of body experiences, and I thought. I told him on the way back, we were driving back down to Sheridan, and I said, I want to teach Western history. I want kids to know what this uh, this this American, uh, 
this American excellence is. We're, it, it's such a, uh, we're such a great place. And we never taught, we were never taught this in college. Never had these classes in American history or even high school American history. And I thought, they need to know what a great country this is and how wonderful our Western history is. And then I, then I, then I, I told my brother, I said, you know what? They don't even have classes like this. I never took one in college. They didn't offer them at ASU. And um, and he said, well, why don't you just go create one? <laughs> so I walked into Coronado High School and I said, um, I'm, um, I want to teach history. You got, it was August. And I was dressed like I am now. And I said, do you need a history teacher here? And she said, um, you know what? Um, Mr. Gould, resigned yesterday to take a college job and we do need a history teacher. Do you know anything about football? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen some games. <laughs> I didn't say that. I went, my models always didn't win it out, uh, go ahead. So I said, sure, sure. <laughs> so, um, so I got hired and um, I was the reverse of the typical history teacher uh, who was also a coach. I was the opposite, uh, so anyway, that's, and I just, I just thought, now what am I going to do? But um, I think, I think I had a, 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 I guess that they say it's a gift of storytelling, and so I started telling stories, and and um, next thing you know, they say, well, you're so hooked on the West, why don't you, why don't we write up a course on Southwest history, and you can teach it, and if you get 30 students to sign up for it. You can be a you can be a Southwest history teacher, and so uh, I I just told the coming seniors I was teaching juniors, and I just said if you didn't get enough of me um, uh, uh, in, in your junior year, I am going to be teaching a one semester course in Southwest history. And the next thing I know, at registrations, 300 and some kids signed up for one class. It was, it was the most popular course at Coronado that had popular courses, believe me. I got 10 sections and um, and that's until I left for Scottsdale Community College. That's what I did. Uh, sadly, they don't even have it anymore. The no. course there, it's really sad to see. But um, Coronado, uh, the reason I'll always be indebted to Coronado High and those students is that they motivated me. They just that's all I can say. So we're having a remedy. What years at Coronado are you talking about? I came there in uh, 1969, and um, I started teaching night classes at SEC in January 1972, and then I moved up to SEC full time in 1977. And I graduated in 2005. <laughs> so we're going to reminisce. I'm going to reminisce here for just a moment because I grew up in Chicago and um, my school system, when I to public schools, were considered the best in the United States at the time I was in school, which was way before you guys were in school. And we had, as an adjunct to the Crow Island School, which was grades kindergarten through five, we had a whole pioneer thing. We had a log cabin with a sod roof and everybody I think it was in fourth grade got to spend two days and we dressed up like the little house on the prairie and they we made soap and we did candles and we had to make cornbread for lunch and it was the whole experience and I remember crying at the end of the second day because I thought I really you know this was so wonderful I'd like to continue it so in fact there were you know even back in the Midwest, there were, you know, people trying to teach us that kind of history. I'm not sure where yeah. it all got lost. We actually got to live it for and two days, which they're, was great. They're getting rid of Lorengo's Wilder books. Well, that's a whole controversy we won't go into. Okay. <laughs> so, Marshall, I'm often hear you refer to as the Arizona historian. Is that an honorary title or is that an actual title? Um, no, it, it's for real. Um, uh, uh, Governor Fife Symington, uh, he was in some political hot water and he needed some good news. So, uh, <laughs> I, gave a, I gave a guest lecture for an ASU program in, uh, to teachers who were taking professional growth credit 
They are fourth grade teachers. I love them. Fourth grade teachers. They are, and, and fourth graders, they still think adults are neat. And, um, so, uh, and they study Arizona history, and it's probably the last time they'll get it. But um, these teachers got together after, the, after I left, uh, the, uh, after my lecture was over, and, um, and, and they said, do we have a state historian? And a fellow named Dick Busher was teaching the class, and he said, uh, not that I know of, and he said, well, we'd like to make Marshall state historian. <laughs> so he called me, and I said, you know what? Those politicians won't do anything unless it's their own idea. <laughs> and lots of luck with it. And so uh, he said, uh, he said, well, uh, they want to try. And um, I still remember Karen Hunter was her name, and she just, she just was not going to take no for an answer. And she kept, she was out in Pendergast School District, way out in the West Valley. It's almost in California. <laughs> and um, she, she kept pushing, and um, pretty soon the governor office called me one day and said we want to have a ceremony down there for you and make you state historian and it's official I've been appointed by every governor since so um, that's um, and it doesn't pay <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I'm still there I go, I go, I go, to ask I, go <laughs> I, I thought we'd leave remuneration it's out all of on my own. Nowadays, it's all my own dime, but for many, many years, 20 years or more, Scottsdale Community College, bless their heart, they, they supported me for gas money to go all over the state and do all these things as, as state historian. So, John, we normally, when you're here, we talk about your crime novels that you write with David Mapstone and other people, but since this is about Marshall, let's talk about the book you published I didn't edit, which is your history of Phoenix, and right. why did you decide to do that? Uh, well, I I, uh, I made the mistake, uh, not the first time in my life, of believing a Megan, I do like the name, who uh, convinced me to uh, write this book for Arcadia Press. And Jack August, bless his soul, uh, who is a great historian, and the loss of him three years ago still cuts me. Uh, he said I should do it. And the problem is, is so small, as they often say. Um, and, um, but I have been wanting to write history books forever. I just couldn't get a paying publisher. I mean, I'm, I, I was very careless in choosing my parents, so I can't, I can't write books on spec. And I would love to write a 400-page Phoenix history. It would be very different than what Phil Vandermeer has written. It would be very different than what the late Brad Luckingham has written, uh, or to the extent that uh, Sheridan mentions it in, in his Arizona history. All these are, are good books, but uh, I would love to write that. But uh, all I got was the relatively brief history of Phoenix, and in that, I tried to, to uh, it's so good to see old friends here uh, that I haven't seen in a while, except on Facebook, um, where we're giving Soviet disinformation, uh, Russian. Um, but um, I, what I tried to do was spin the story ahead in ways that people haven't heard before. I mean, a lot of people here don't know anything about Phoenix history. They say, you know, we can't, we just got here from Dayton, Ohio, and this place has no history because they're in a subdivision and a big Walmart's across the street, and, and au contraire, you know, this has a more of a history than Dayton, Ohio, a town I love, um, and so I want to tell that, but but also I wanted to uh, spin it forward with new interpretations, for instance, of Jack Swilling and um, and that sort of. Thing. But you were able to incorporate that into the bomb shelter in part um, because there's a lot of history about Don Bowles and also about, I learned a lot about people that I know I actually once met Barry Goldwater, but um, I thought it was fascinating the way you brought in some of the pioneer family, so to speak, and set up the whole scenario for why you know, what may have led up to the Don Bowles and what the consequences were. Stay Marshall, you said that you lived through that, so why don't you guys talk about the Bowles case a little bit? 
Well, I'll, I'll be fairly brief and then turn it over to Marshall, but the, uh, uh, the, the bomb, all of the, you know, David Mapstone is a defrocked history professor who becomes a sheriff's deputy in a very different sheriff's department, uh, one led by his family. <coughs> Um, and so every David Mapstone novel has history in it, and history of Phoenix. There's a lot more of it, especially of the 70s and 60s in the bomb shelter. And, and a lot of this is stuff that I not only lived through, but you know, I was taught Arizona history by Mr. Trimble, and I was always a history nut, and my mother was deeply involved in Arizona politics, so I, I knew a great deal of this. I mean, when I, and then on Rogue Columnist, my Phoenix uh, site, where I continue to write columns about Phoenix and Arizona, one of the things I do is I write history, and I've been doing that now for 11 years, writing these kind of basic history tutorials about everything, uh, from uh, the decades, the 30s, 40s, 50s, to things like the Salt River Project, which is not just an ordinary utility. Uh, my Don Bowles story is that that was when I was an EMT paramedic, and uh, I was on, I was off duty the 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 night that they offed uh, uh, Murray Miranda. Uh, although a certain detective I know was the night detective then, and, and was first on the scene, um, and. Uh, but I was off duty. I came on duty and they said Miranda bought it last night. Ah. Um, and that was down on the deuce. But I was on duty the night of the day they, they bombed Bowles. <clears throat> and of course I knew Don Bowles because I'd been reading the Republic and the Gazette all my life. <coughs> so we were, we were on duty and we were <coughs> the, the calls rotated between ambulance companies and, and uh, among ambulance companies and then units. And so we picked up a call for an auto collision at 16th and Southern, which is called 962 by radio code. And then the next call in rotation was the bombing at the Clarendon house, as it was called in those days. And a friend of mine went on that call, and she had Don Bowles in her arms when he said, they finally got me. They finally got me. Adamson, Emprise, Mafia, find John Adamson, and then he passed out. And so the bomb shelter is a fictionalized version of this, uh, I think it's true to the spirit of what happened, but I'm not going to say that this is absolutely uh, what happened in detail. Marshall, what's your experience with the bomb? Well, um, I almost got into a parking lot fight with John Adamson Thank God I didn't know who he was. <laughs> He's a lot bigger than me, too. Um, uh, a friend and I from ASU, we had gone down to uh, Phoenix uh, and we're having lunch, and he parked his car uh, in one of those bank parking lots, and I guess Adamson was the, um, uh, was the enforcer for people who were not supposed to park on Central Avenue where they, uh, and, um, when I came to Phoenix in 1955, from all the way from Ash Fork, you could park anywhere you wanted to uh, on Central Avenue, but it was kind of different. Uh, and, and, I, and, and we went out to the car, and there was a doggone club attached to it. One of those big, heavy things, and I tried to lift it off and pull it, trying to figure out how to get the thing off of there. It wasn't even my car, but um, uh, the, the other fellow and I, we'd been in the Marines together, so we were good friends. and. And I, uh, and all of a sudden this big fellow walks up, and uh, I said, "Get this thing off of this car." And he went on to his spiel, and um, I didn't know at the time. I didn't know his name. I didn't know who it was till later. I found out it was John Adamson, and my friend 
And I'm a, I'm a little guy, and my friend had to pull me away from this guy because pride made me want to take him on. Nobody should attach something to a car, even if it's just a friend of mine. And um, that was my first experience with him, and I didn't know it till later it came out that he was he was putting things on cars uh, there on at that place. And and then later, um, I have to say, my my former wife married. Uh, Kemper Marley Jr. and um, and I liked Kemper Marley Jr. Um, I'd known him for a long time. He was a good roper. He, he was he's a heck of a roper and ride horses and uh, you know we did a lot of stuff like that. So when he married my former wife, I thought well that's okay. I even went to his funeral um, uh, afterwards. But um, Kemper was but I, I'd also met his father, uh, Kemper Marley Sr. And um, if somebody ever gives you chills when you meet them, uh, he did, uh, and and I and he he was a cold he was a cold cold fella, yeah. And so I uh, I just that's that was my experience with with that family. And then I was only as a historian uh, only paying attention to you know when the reporters came out and did, I still got that book about, that the reporters did on it investigative reporters and um, I just I just I just thought there's these guys were from the old school the old west they were tight-lipped and I've met some of them as a historian up in on the Blue River and places like that where those guys there's a there's an interesting bunch up there um, a girl a, woman, a young woman asked me one time she said my grandfather uh, was part of, a, of the feud that was going on here and um, and she, 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 he won't tell me anything uh, Marshall he probably talked to you because you you know you wearing boots and jeans and, <laughs> and, uh, and I looked over there were four or five men old old men sitting there under a tree and they looked at me like son don't even come over here. <laughs> and uh, that was th that was what those guys were like. They were the same way some of the people I knew. Jim Roberts' uh, uh, son, Bill Roberts, uh, from the Pleasant Valley War, and he said, "My dad and his dad was the top gun for the Tewksburys in that war." And he said, "My dad never even talked about it. Wouldn't talk about it." And even after he shot those two bank robbers in Clarkdale in 1932, I think it was, said he came home and he just told my mom. Um, she said, why are you late for lunch? And he said, oh, there's a little trouble downtown. <laughs> I mean, those guys were tight-lipped. And, um, and that's how this, and, and that's the same way uh, the, that bunch later in, in, the, it, that, in, the, in the 1970s, those guys did not talk. I don't know if we'll ever know the story. Uh, and the guys who probably knew her dead. The thing about Marley was that he was absolutely of that Old West thing. I mean, he, yes, he got the liquor license from Al Capone and went on to be, assemble huge parcels of the land, get very rich off of it. But, but Kemper Marley Sr. was an old-time Arizona tough guy cowboy in the Depression. <coughs> He had organized gangs to go after supposed communists trying to organize farm workers. And, and speaking of which, uh, there's going to be a little trouble downtown if you don't all mute your cell phones. I say that in a friendly way. <laughs> well, I first came here in 1950 when there were two paved roads in Scottsdale. And the city was not incorporated. I haven't lived here then I moved here in 1986, but the rumor always was among my family and so forth that Kemper Marley was behind the, the bombing of Don Bowles, but nobody ever actually proved it, and so one doesn't know if it was like a Henry II moment, you know, we rid me of this turbulent priest and some people, which is sort of what they're trying to do with Khashoggi. They're trying to spin, you know, his assassination in the same way. That, oh, no, it really wasn't, you know, the crown prince. It really was, you know, some overeager henchman, which is certainly theoretically possible, but you still have to... Henry took, I think, eventual responsibility for what happened, old Henry II. Um, 
You know, so you we don't have know. To read the bomb shelter. Yeah, <laughs> we don't really know. You know, and we'll never know. I agree with you. That's the real sad part is that it's going to be like Lizzie Borden and, and other sort of legendary <laughs> crimes. Nobody will ever know for sure. Yeah, I've just been working on a thing uh, with the assassination. I call it the assassination of Pat Garrett, the man who shot Billy the Kid. Oh, yeah. And um, he was really Albert Fall, was the mob leader, mafia type mob leader in New Mexico. And, uh, and he, he, they murdered Albert Fountain uh, and his son Henry. They never found him. And, and they got away with it. And when you start really look, looking into the West, Western history, you find out these guys got away with murder all the time. And uh, those of us who grew up watching Western movies in the 40s, <laughs> we, we always believed that the good guy always got caught. And, and that's, what, that's what the preachers told us, that's what our teachers told us, that's what our parents told us. If you break the law, kid, you're going to get busted. You're and I grew up believing that. <laughs> Uh, Fort Grant for us. It was Fort Grant, you know. Uh, and um, my evil older brother, well, I wouldn't say evil, but he was just a prankster. Uh, but he, um, he, he, he had a choice of going to the Air Force or Fort Grant during the Korean War. <laughs> he chose the Korean War. Wow, that's a mystery. Well, I think the thing, John, that I found the most interesting about the bomb shelter was not so much who did it, but rather... Um, all the forces in play that that cooperated, <coughs> you know, made it impossible to figure out what happened. Right. There were so many different um, agendas and power plays and people like the Rosenzweigs and the Goldwaters and other people in, in your book that, you know, obscured it all. Um, and all of that is, is actually true. Yeah. And in the book, they reemerge. Um, and you don't know who is guilty of what. Uh, one of the things about mid-century Phoenix that is interesting, and, and this starts in the late 1920s when uh, Gus Greenbaum uh, was dispatched by the Chicago mob to set up a gambling wire with the hub in Phoenix because Phoenix was nowhere. Uh, Phoenix had just gotten a mainline railroad. And so nobody's going to look for the, the Chicago outfit in Phoenix. And from then on, there was this very blurry line between respectable Phoenix and mob Phoenix. Now, when I was growing up, and I graduated from Coronado in 1974, um, our conceit was that Tucson was the mob town and Phoenix was the clean town. <laughs> and of course, nothing Not could true. be further from the truth because Phoenix was, uh, in the late 50s, the FBI estimated Phoenix had more made men per capita than any other city in the country, even New York. And, and it was a, it was a, a, a neutral town. Uh, that was kind of uh, the, the utility provider was the Chicago outfit. But you could have mobsters here from everybody. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, Johnny Stampanato mm -hmm. from the LA mob mm -hmm. uh, spent time here and, and just about everybody did. And everybody abided by this kind of neutrality. But, but the other thing that is fascinating is that uh, when Gus Greenbaum was killed in Palm Croft in 1958. He was assassinated uh, by a, a mafia hit squad. Uh, Gus was the master of the skin, and so the, the mob wanted him to keep running these hotels in Las Vegas so that they would uh, get their skin and they would be safe. But um, Gus... Excuse me, John. Oh, that's okay. Marsh, don't worry. Um, I'll probably have to do the same soon, but the, uh, depending on what he's doing, maybe. <laughs> he's not the first audience member I've made leave. Uh, boredom. But, He'll be back. Don't worry. Uh, no, that's a joke. Uh, the, um, but Gus had, had a uh, heroin problem, and, and he had a uh, too many mistress problem. Uh, I've had one of those, but 
you can pick. Um, <laughs> before I was married, of course. Um, and so he eventually became a liability. They warned him, they warned him, they warned him, and he wouldn't change. He and, But he had a home in Phoenix, and he commutes to Las Vegas, little Las Vegas back in those days. And so the hitmen came in while he and his wife were fixing steaks for dinner, and they assassinated Gus in the bedroom, and then they assassinated the wife in the living room. Uh, remember what I said about muting your cell phones? I do have hitmen here. Um, te absolvo, or absolvo te if you're a Latin purist. Uh, Mr. O'Flaherty was another great teacher at Coronado, Magister O. But um, so they killed them separately. They put uh, Gus's wife on the sofa. They killed Gus back in the bedroom, slit his throat. And then uh, the, I, I hear uh, from detectives in the know that uh, the hitmen then ate the steaks <laughs> before they left. And, and uh, Barry Goldwater went to Gus Greenbaum's funeral. So you had these mobsters like Gus, and you had Barry and uh, the Rosenzweig brothers and others in respectable Phoenix who were friends with them. And so the line was very murky. And, and when, uh, when Harry Rosenzweig persuaded Barry Goldwater to run for city council in, in uh, 1948 on the reform ticket, charter government committee, uh, and they were going to clean up all the corruption in Phoenix, and uh, and this is actually in in, in Harry's papers uh, that that Barry said to Harry Rosenzweig. He said, "Harry, these are all the things we like." <laughs> but Barry was actually a very effective councilman. So. What is it you're going to write next? Because we had a little conversation about that, and you're thinking about writing a book that goes back farther in time. Well, I, uh, you know, everybody wants to have stone books, and when they finish the latest one, they say, when is the next one? <laughs> and I have not been anointed yet, so I still have to do my day job and write these books. And um, there might be another map stone. I'd love to write a Cincinnati case book if Cincinnati mystery sold. But I'm also kind of noodling around in my brain this idea of a uh, private eye in depression era Phoenix. Because that's, uh, in, in graduate school, my, my uh, speciality, as they say at Oxford, where I read history, uh, Oxford, Ohio, <laughs> was in uh, America in the Progressive Era and the Great Depression. And so I know a lot about Phoenix back then, and I've been through city directories where, you know, they had everybody listed and every business listed. And I've, I've thought that if people can be patient about another map stone, I might stick in and hope it doesn't turn into a series. Um, no, I'm just joking. I might stick in this private eye in Depression era Phoenix because the city was so interesting then. And guess who was around in Depression era Phoenix? Kipper Marley was, <laughs> Gus Greenbaum was, uh, uh, young Barry Goldwater was, and uh, you know you can throw in all sorts of things. So Marshall, tell us a little bit about the oddities in your book. Uh, let me let me just say a couple more things. I was just thinking about John was talking. Uh, I was working at Encanto Park, um, working my way through college uh, at Encanto Park um, when Gus Greenbaum was was capped there, and was right on the outskirt, right next to the park there. And I remember that. And I, at the time, I'd never heard of Gus Greenbaum, but I sure, I sure found out who he was in a hurry. But it was it was it was there. And um, and I and in the late 1970s, uh, Barry Goldwater wrote the um, intro for my first uh, book with Doubleday, and, um, oh, that one, yeah. <laughs> and on the, on the front it says, with an introduction by Barry Goldwater, pe people would always say, uh, uh, 
I, I like that book you and Barry wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm no fool. I knew I knew Double Day used his name there just to sell books, and it did sell well. And I got all the money, so I don't care. <laughs> but um, uh, his office called me and they said, um, uh, "We're looking for uh, some some younger people on the Arizona Historical Foundation board, and um, the senator would like for you to." Uh, to accept uh, uh, an appointment to that board, and I did, and I found myself in there with Harry Rosenzweig and Frank Snell and people like that, that only names that were familiar to me in the newspapers, uh, and, and Harry, old poker face Harry, I tell you, you can never tell what he was thinking. And, um, but we'd sit there, I'd sit there quietly because I knew better than to open my mouth, I'd show how stupid I was, you know, how do you feel around people like that. It's like I, when I sat with Louis L'Amour one time, and and, uh, and I, I, I thought, I'm not going to open my mouth. <laughs> He's going to find out I don't know anything. But um, anyway, the, the, uh, I, I sat there listening to those guys tell stories about the 1920s and 30s. And I thought, man, uh, this, this can never leave this room. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was fascinating as a young historian to, to be exposed to all that. And, and it just... Uh, I just wanted to throw that out there that, 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 that it's, it's interesting to be, to have met those people that oh, yeah. everybody talks about. And, and I never knew Greenbaum, but I sure was, I was there, I was working the day they, the morning when the cops all came. But anyway, I just wanted to. Oh, what that's people, very what nice, people. but why don't you give us just a little word or two about Arizona oddities before oh, okay. we open this up to questions. Yeah, well. I, I, I used the. I, I was going to call it a land of anomalies and tamales, yeah. and um, history press. Uh, history press thought it, it ought to be Arizona oddities with a subtitle, and I. Um, it, these were just stories. Uh, I, I've made a good living out there on the convention circuit, um, uh, just telling stories about what's so unusual about Arizona. You know, because people ask me all the time, and I get this rhetorical question what's so special about Arizona? And I say, it's a great place to work, and it's the open spaces. I love the open spaces of this place, because 90% of the people live on 2% of the land. Most of them live in Tucson or Phoenix. And so I think, um, and I grew up in an area where I was, um, uh, uh, when, in, in the 1980s, I did, I, I did a, documentary, a, a documentary for the uh, West German group. And, um, <coughs> They asked me, they took me all around. I took them way up to the plateau where I grew up um, and um, where you could look forever and not even see a telephone, telephone pole. And um, they said, uh, Hardy Kruger was the uh, narrator. He's a German movie star. and He always plays General Rommel. <laughs> <laughs> or the U-boat skipper or something like that. But he's a great guy. We got along great. He's the only one in the outfit that spoke English. And so, um, but the crew was just, in awe of this, of we're looking out there, and he said, uh, Marshall, um, this was when two Germanys were divided, and he said, uh, uh, how many people live in it, how many, live, how many people in Arizona, and I said about, oh, I think about three and a half million right now, and he said, um, um, you know how many people, West Germany is about the same size as Arizona, and you know how many people we have in West Germany, and um, uh, I said, no, and he said, 60 million. And I thought, 60 million people? Well, I really love these open spaces even more. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just tell people, it's, it's, it's yours, mine, and everybody's, and nobody's. But I, I, And I think, we're, we're just a land, we are a, a land of anomalies. The, the, the first white man to come here was a black man. And um, the first cowboy was an Indian. He was a mission named him for the Jesuits down in southern Arizona. And the first, the first big cattleman in Arizona was Eulalia Elias of a, 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 a Mexican land grant. And uh, finally the Apaches drove her out. And um, the, the, the Spanish colonel who founded the Pueblo of Tucson um, was an Irishman, a red-headed Irishman named Hugh O'Connor. <laughs> Those Irish are ubiquitous. Besides that, they're everywhere. Um, but I mean, it just goes. I just goes on. I, I've never ceased to be amazed. And uh, like I say, other than the time in the military, I've never been away from here. And this place still amazes me. Uh, just, uh, and I thought, 
I think people would like this. And so I just thought, I'm going to write a book and just put all these stories in there. But I also I also included other stories about Jack Swilling, for example, and um, and uh, uh, try to bring uh, bring some justice to Kit Carson, who was everybody's hero when we were young, and then he's been ripped uh, you know by by modern day revisionists and Patricia Lemery. Yeah, yeah, that, that type, and and it, it's really sad that these that, that we're seeing these people. Uh, that they're really products of their own time. And we, we make judgments calls on them now. And um, my, my family's Confederate. Uh, I mean, they were Southern, they were Texas, and they were Southerners, and they fought for the Confederacy because that's what they believed in. And those people had, those were their beliefs, what the, you know. And I think now they're wanting to tear, well, if, if, if they start tearing down the Washington Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial, uh, where do we stop? Where does it all end? I, I'm preaching now. I didn't mean to get into that. That's not about the book. <laughs> I, I, I do want to just weigh in here and, and back up Marshall because we've, you know, the right has just gone crazy bonkers, but the left is capable of it too. I can't even discuss the Civil War with my liberal friends because they go so crazy. And in, in the history business, it's, it's called the anachronism fan, uh, fallacy, which is where you are uh, taking today's beliefs as if we know everything now, and then you're transplanting it back to a period in time and making judgments on that. And the problem with it, among many other things, is that it interferes with your understanding of that period in time. You can't understand history, and so you devalue history if you don't understand the the uh, the people in their time. Guess what? Guess who one of the biggest imperialists in the North American continent was? It was the uh, the Comanches. Uh, Guess who widely kept slaves? It was American Indians. Uh, I'm totally opposed to slaveholding, but I had family on both sides of the Civil War. In one case, it was literally brother against brother. And but I can't even talk about the Civil War with my liberal friends now. Yeah, it's, William Manchester really had a great quote on that: was um, taking today's values um, uh, and and. Their, their old, and, and putting them on an earlier period and um, expecting, you know, expecting that, that, that this is, because I, I don't have the exact quote now. I used to have it memorized. I haven't had to use it in a while, but uh, that taking today's values and, 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 and putting them on people that lived 150, 200 years ago. But what are people going to say about us in 200 years? <laughs> Uh, do they have that right? Uh, and uh, that's that's what makes you really you, you need they need to stop and think about that. But it doesn't it doesn't seem to fly very well today. And uh, it just um, and I lived through Senator McCarthy. And, oh yeah, you know, yeah. Yep, the only big fight I ever had with my father, I was washed down the steps of the San Francisco courthouse protesting against Tuac when I was a student at Stanford. My father and I were on the different sides of all of that and. You know, I remember the McCarthy going up, and then I remember how everything was rejected afterward. And mm -hmm. I think we're in another place where, you know, stuff is going on that we may be horrified by 20 years from now, but while we're going through it, on all sides, as you say, left and right, you know, and it's happening all over the world, too. I mean, Germany's going through convulsions the whole bit. So, you know, we're in a time of, um, I don't know what the right word is, but it's it's too bad it's so antagonistic. And let's move on to questions because, yeah, in yeah. fact, this All is right. not a political forum. Yeah, yeah. Either one. Yeah. Right. So who would like to ask questions? Anybody? No? We silenced you with all that? There's one over there. Well, this is more of a comment, but the Winnie Luke Jen story has a lot of unknowns still to this day, right, with powerful people that were involved in that. And we still don't know all about Yes, just talk to Jenna Boomer's ball. I know. <laughs> a lot of Jenna will be here on the 27th of November with something else, but the Trunk Murders, which was a um, Jenna Boomer was a Trunk Murders Committee member. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Come on, you gotta have questions. Okay, back here. Don, did you learn all of your history from him, or did you pick up a few things afterwards? <laughs> did did I learn a lot afterwards? Did I learn all of my history from him? Yes, I did. No, I, I, um, you know, I, I went uh, to ASU and, and got a history uh, double major along with theater, and then I, I got a, a history masters from Miami of Ohio. Question for John: What was the mafia doing here in the 30s, 40s, and 50s? What were they involved in? What were they doing? Well, they were involved in everything until prohibition ended. They were involved in in liquor. They were involved in prostitution. They were involved in protection rackets. So that you know, a, a, a mobster would come to Barbara and say, "Nice little bookshop you have here, Shane. <laughs> Be a pity if something happened to it," and she'd have to give pay protection money to keep the mob from burning it down. Uh, there was uh, gambling was a big deal, drugs if I didn't already say that. And the, the police department up until uh, Chief Thomas in the 50s was very, very corrupt. Uh, the killing of uh, Officer David Starr Johnson by Detective Frenchie Navarre is still uh, an open case in some ways because uh, when when uh, uh, Frenchie killed Johnson, Johnson was black officer, Frenchie was white, uh, was it all about race or was it about something else? Because for instance, uh, the police officers, the detectives in the, the 1940s, this happened in 1944, the detectives uh, uh, helped kind of uh, oversee the red light district, which was essential for the city of Phoenix's revenues. Mm -hmm. And yet they wanted to tamp it down and keep it under control. And of course, the detectives took their own skin. And uh, Navarre and Johnson got in a fight over something that has never really been settled. Uh, because Navarro was a detective, Johnson was a patrolman, he and his, his partner, uh, Joe, uh, forgive me, but they were the first black officers to uh, walk a patrol beat downtown. They were very popular. Phoenix had had uh, African American police officers since 1919. And uh, so there, there was already bad blood between Frenchie and Star Johnson, um, but was something else involved? When Star Johnson was gunned down and Frenchie was taken into custody, uh, the made men lined up to bail him out because it was <coughs> considered a point of honor to be the one to post the bail. And the bail was posted with a, a, a suitcase full of money. And so that's just one of many examples of what the Mafia was doing then. By the 1950s, the business model had changed with Las Vegas and, and uh, other things, and it was more uh, drugs and uh, continued prostitution. Uh, you know, there was a story that Harry Rosenzweig uh, ran some whorehouses, including a high-end one where uh, he, uh, he could tape uh, Phoenix officials in flagrante. Um, like a county attorney. Uh, yeah, that you know that's true. Uh, we won't say which county attorney, not the city county attorney or the lying down county attorney. Um, but um, and and then the big enchilada was land fraud. Uh, billions of dollars in land fraud was committed. I mean, now it's done. Uh, legally, and it's called sprawl, but it, it used to be, you know, the Arizona I grew up in had a million people in, you know, the sixth largest state in the country, but it had only a million people, and um, so they're all over the country, they, these fraudsters would sell Arizona land, and uh, it, they didn't have title to it, didn't have water, didn't have utilities, but they said it did. And, and this money would just roll in, and it was all 
of mob connected and, and of course the godfather of Arizona land fraud was Ned Warren and the he'd sell it over and over again he would sell it over and over again and he would always have a fine man who would be the president of the company that was doing this who could go down Phoenix police repeatedly took cases to the county attorney to uh, you know please prosecute this you know officers like uh, Lonzo or crack and um, um, you know they and and they would have uh, Ned Warren dead to rights and the these things would just go to die in the county attorney's office and and the, some of this is in the bomb shelter um, and uh, you know the FBI has done a lot to kill off the old mob now we have all sorts of new organized crime, but they're still around here. Go down to, what's the restaurant on Thomas Avanti? Yeah, uh, go in there so some cool. night. Yeah, go. Uh, it's just a very cool restaurant. Yeah, go in there yeah. some night and just look around and you'll you'll see people like, you know, on the Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> there was another question. Just one comment. If you just think about what all organized crime considered Al Capone went to jail for tax evasion. They had to do something with their money. Yeah. And, and this is a star of the uh, clean part of the Organized Crime Bureau of the Phoenix Police. There was a question back there from a woman, yes? Um, less fun, exciting topic, uh, perhaps. Um, what was the Oh, is that me? Both. <laughs> oh. Uh, my antenna is always up for a good story, and um, and I just take it and like I do a good song, I make it my own. <laughs> I, I was gonna tell you, I was gonna say while ago when you mentioned Harry Rosenzweig, um, I was sitting in one of those uh, foundation meetings one time, and um, Barry started telling the story about when they closed uh, down in the Deuce. Uh, the houses of prostitution when uh, I think it was the general uh, the, the general it was in World War II and they were declaring martial law on Phoenix they were getting ready to declare it was martial limits. law made it off limits yeah and um, and I remember Barry Barry was talking about that and he said and so it came time on the city council we had to close these down and he said, and Harry owned a whole bunch of those houses on the deuce. <laughs> and, and he looked over and he said, uh, when it came time to vote, Harry rode, rose his hand to vote, r r to vote aye. And uh, he said, I saw a tear running down Harry's <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Harry sat there poker faced, and that's my most memorable moment in the back rooms of those, of those board meetings. Um, I'll do the dull stuff. Marshall is so good at the fun stuff. Although there's fun stuff in the bomb shelter, car chases, sex scenes. Um, the um, it's the in between stuff that I have trouble with. I mean, of course you you know you can make use of what are called secondary sources. I mean, you want to read the existing gold standard literature on the subject you're writing about. But then you have to go into the primary sources, and that's where you want to go into the, the papers of the individuals involved. You want to read the newspapers of that era, diaries, um, reports that can be anything from uh, the, the buying and selling of ranch supplies to uh, the uh, you know, in my case, police reports, land sales. Um, you know, if 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 they're uh, if they're not, uh, uh, you know, if they're if they're open to the public, uh, you know, police reports, intelligence reports, things like that. Um, the uh, uh, the essential book on this is called The Modern Researcher. Uh, by Jacques Berzon and his last name is Graf and now I'm showing my age. But Graf and Barzon's book called The Modern Researcher 
that is the essential book on the historian's techniques. Thank you, John. And you know what? We've all been sitting now for an hour. Yeah, we that. I'm sorry. One quick comment. Sure. The Bowles case, Maricopa County uh, Superior Court, is sealed. You can't get it. Don't give away the book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'd like you to thank our authors for coming to see us this evening. Facebook audience for joining us, and mostly we'd like to thank you for coming out this evening because without you, we'd just be sitting here talking to each other, right? Which would be sort of fun. But seriously, we really appreciate your coming out to support the authors. I'm going to ask. Can, can, Facebook, can Facebook Photoshop my nose? <laughs> it doesn't show under your hat. Yeah, no, 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 no. If you would like to migrate over to this nifty little table over.